Welcome to COVID Talks. I have the pleasure to have with me Dr. Mukesh Haikawal. He is a family physician in Melbourne, Australia. He is past chair of the Australian Medical Association and past chair of the World Medical Association Council. Welcome, Dr. Haikawal. Thank you. Good to see you again. Mukesh, you, you have been always at the forefront of family practice, whether that was developing um, telemedicine, telecare in, in family practice, or looking also into the social determinants of health um, when you offered additional services in your, in your family clinic, um, like, for instance, cooking courses. Could you tell us a little bit what happened to you when you started seeing the pandemic coming to Australia and how you adapted in your family practice to the pandemic coming up? Yeah, so we sort of were more concerned towards the end of January. Uh, you remember that in Australia we would had a terrible season of bushfires and smoke, and even though that wasn't uh, too problematic in Melbourne, we did have many days of very thick smoke and dense haze, um, uh, as did most of our south southeast corner of Australia. So we came out of that, and COVID was becoming a problem. Um, and we uh, started just by putting up posters, by making people more aware of this and getting some governance about how we would deal with the case of COVID if we got it in our practice, because we were reading reports that if you had somebody with you, uh, you would have to have complete personal protective equipment. And if you saw them in one of the rooms, um, you know, you'd have to clean everything around you. And it was quite onerous. Um, and so we put aside a room where we'd see people. We set up specially. We would then clean it out and then use it, and you know, not use it for 24 hours. So we that was the first level of, you know, it's not going to be too bad. We just do one room and, and so on. And we didn't have much protective equipment either because you prepare for one or two cases, uh, you know, a month if you're unlucky. Um, and of course, it, it moved from there. So we were prepared for, in the first step to do whatever we thought was coming, which wasn't so horrendous, then all of a sudden we saw the whole thing escalate out of control. And we were doing more uh, testing of people, uh, and there was more people coming back from uh, areas where there was uh, COVID. Um, and what we were finding is that we had to be more active in maintaining it. We made a decision that we wouldn't treat people in our rooms, but we would treat them outside um, in the car park. By doing that, it meant that we wouldn't get a room in the building that was um, infected and therefore having to be cleaned. Um, and if we did in the car park in the patient's cars, it was safe for them as well. So what is now the procedure when a patient arrives at, at your clinic in the parking lot? What do you do actually? So we've evolved our care from a sporadic going getting dressed into PPE and doing this in the car park, um, uh, which we actually had a front end of that using telehealth. So people would actually phone ahead. We'd say, okay, we'll see you come to the car park, come into our video consulting suite, which is on our software, um, and we can look at the software of telehealth and do the um, normal clinical notes at the same time. And to so have a good consultation face-to-face -face with vision which you can see so much more on. Uh, and then if you need to do the test, you would then finalize it in the car park, wearing PPE um, and doing the test and therefore being able to build that as a, as a consultation. Of course, what's happened is that even that uh, became problematic. We ran out of masks, we ran out of gloves, we ran out of swabs. Um, and uh, so patients were then just being asked to go to the hospital. In the interim, what's happened is the Australian government has set up 100 uh, Commit, uh, 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 committed general practice respiratory clinics. And these are uh, set up to de take patients decanted from other practices where they're not prepared to see people with respiratory disease and um, they come to us, we see them for the respiratory disease and if they actually need to have a, 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 a COVID test with a swab, uh, we do that as well. So we set this up on the 1st of April we were given the keys, and we've been going for about a month. Um, and we're seeing about 80 patients um, uh, in, in a day, um, and that's, that's pretty significant for our size of practice. 
which is kind of a, a separate little clinic in your parking lot now. So in Canton, is that correct? Yeah. That's right. So the uh, we we set up four consulting rooms um, and a dedicated um, you know area to look after them, um, which has literally been made up of portable cabins that were joined together with a walkway, uh, ramps on and ramps off, and a roof. Um, when it was built, it was it was summer. Now we're in winter. We're going to have to put some heating there. But the apart from the fact that we do the business, which I'll describe in a minute, in the rooms, we have a separate part of this, which is a dedicated drive-through facility where patients can actually drive through, uh, be tested, and leave without actually coming out of their cars. But to get to that stage is the whole governance that we put in place to make it safe. But then also in your in your um, clinic, you also have taken measures in order to separate streams a little bit. Yes. So, so if we start from the beginning, if somebody comes to our practice, we now have a, a, a tent at the front of the building, which is our triage site. Anybody who has a respiratory uh, illness is decanted away from our clinic and our buildings and our tendencies inside uh, to a separate respiratory clinic, which is down in the car park. As people enter the building, uh, they are asked several several questions as part of the triage. They have their temperature taken, um, and um, if they've got any respiratory illnesses, they're asked to go to the respiratory clinic. When they come into the building, uh, we've got like passport control tape around each entrance around the desk at the, um, at the uh, uh, reception. We have very few chairs in the waiting area. People are asked to wait in the car, and when the doctor is ready, they'll be called in. And in fact, some of our doctors are actually still doing consultations in the car park, in the patient's cars, to reduce the traffic into the building. Um, so when somebody comes in, if they've actually managed to make it into the building, um, they are deemed to be free of respiratory, but nonetheless, we um, keep everything clean. We don't gown up at this stage. We don't mask up because they're deemed to be clear of respiratory illness. We keep our distance within within the building, um, and we certainly maintain that hand hygiene, which is really obviously very important and key. Um, the people who don't qualify to come into the building um, are either looked after by the patients in the car park, by the doctors in the car park, or they go to the respiratory clinic in the back. Um, and also uh, the, the doctors um, who work in the clinic, most of them are actually working in the other clinic, as, in the respiratory clinic as well. So it's kind of a, a part of our business. Um, we also have a control room up in the upstairs, which directs all those operations, because it's not your normal general medical practice. We have put in some real significant enhancements. I always say that we've been doing... 20 years of healthcare uh, development that I've been trying to get into place in three and a half weeks because we had a crisis and we had to manage it. We had to keep people safe in our building and those looking after those patients. Consider you have a patient that in the parking in the parking lot already has been identified as a potential um, COVID-19 patient and you take a swab. So what is the protocol then you follow with that with that patient? Uh, you probably send them back home, tell them they should stay home, and, and how do you proceed with that? Yeah, um, well, I mean, to, to get to that point of having the swab done, um, we, we again, get them to, to make contact with our clinic. Uh, when they make contact with the clinic, they are uh, provide, details are taken and an appointment is made, and a nurse does a nurse triage to make sure they met the criteria that they have to be seen, and whether they're fit to go through the drive-through process and not have a physical examination, or whether they need to have a physical examination. Um, we're actually assembling them off-site in an off-site car park because our site becomes too congested with traffic if we, if we bring everybody on. Um, and there was a danger that if, if it became really difficult and we had large numbers like in other parts of the world, we would need to be able to manage the traffic better. So we've preempted that by having traffic management off-site and then on-site, and we bring them through. Um, we often wouldn't do the, the triage by phone, but we have the ability to do that by video. When they come into our facility to do the, the testing, 
um, they come into a room, they're greeted by a nurse and a health assistant who's a lay person who has been trained to um, you know, uh, help the nurse or help the doctor, um, but basically be more arms and legs. So everything is very well thought out and planned and structured. So it takes the load off the doctor um, and the nurse. So they're um, uh, triaged again before the decision is made. Uh, yes, you can do the drive through, so you can drive through and go, or you come into the rooms. When they come into the rooms, the doctor sits and has a conversation with the patient. There's a video link to a scribe, which is unique in our setting. The um, the um, scribe uh, will do uh, the do doctor's notes for them. When the doctor talks to the screen and the notes are done off-site, the doctor can review it. But there's actually an overseeing doctor to make sure it's all done properly upside as well. So medically led, uh, medically driven, um, proper quality control, using uh, people who can help and support that process well. So these are all enhancements that we've made to that process because we started off seeing 20 or 30 in a day. We're now doing 80 to 100 in a day. And we've geared it to do that so that you don't burn out the doctors or the nurses or anybody else. You support them and you make them safe. So when we do the work, we're obviously fully gloved with a mask and a visor and a gown. Um, and we make sure that we have everyone protected in that process. Now, the question you asked is, you do the swab, what happens then? Um, when they've done the swab, they are deemed to have COVID until proven otherwise. And they're asked to go home and self-isolate for two to five days uh, until the result comes back. They're also called when the result comes back. And if they're negative, they're asked to might be mindful of false negatives. If there are any symptoms, not to go to work um, and to wait until they're better before they go back to work. And then they can go back to work. If it's a positive swab, it becomes a matter for the health department who are very diligent in identifying the patient, their contacts, and make sure that there's contact tracing. The individual is put into uh, quarantine for 14 days uh, in their own home. Um, but obviously, if they get worse, they are then moved out of their home into the hospital system. Um, we haven't done what other countries have done, which have a bed for everyone who's got positive tests. So, and I, I assume that, that with a negative test, then they stay as your patients, uh, considering yes. that there are still some other minor symptoms because it may be common cold, maybe something different. Uh, that's exactly right. Yes. Um, now, we had a chance previously to talk to um, Dr. Tony Bartone, the president of the Australian Medical Association, and he pointed out quite rightly that the Australia has been lucky so far with a, a relatively low number of infected persons and, of course, of diseased persons. Uh, but still, we have to consider that you are going from summer to autumn and now into winter. And, and that may change the, the situation. So that, that is probably also a reason why you are setting up such um, a strong management and, and powerful management in order to, to test the person. So is that still something you have in mind that this may come up? It's very much a concern. We knew as we were coming out of January, February, we were going to be going into winter. Um, we start our immunization of influenza uh, generally um, March, April, um, and uh, we've been uh, waiting for our stock to come to try and get as many people immunized. In a practice like ours, we do 2,500 a year. We're expecting 5,000 of those that are paid for by the government on the government scheme. And we've got a massive number of people wanting it anyway, because also people have noticed that to get COVID is one thing, to get the flu is another, to get them both together is a disaster. That leads me to a last question, which I would like to address to you. What we have heard now from, from many other countries is that there may be a very specific collateral damage by people not seeking health care because they fear of being infected in a healthcare institution, or because they don't want to burden the healthcare system with their what they believe are minor things and, and they don't want to go. So we have already heard about some severe cases which didn't go to the hospital or to the clinic or to the doctor. Is that something you see as well, that there is a reduction of normal cases? Yeah, it's been a major issue when, when we got the shutdown in place. We dropped throughput through general practice 
30 percent. Um, in fact, there was no way of compensating general practice for that. Um, we fought very long and very hard uh, you know, strategically to allow telehealth, telemedicine consultations to be allowed for normal face-to-face -face consultations. That saved general practice. And when it was first introduced, it was very constrained. Uh, we pushed and pushed and pushed. We now have it available for every Australian to see any doctor with with telehealth or video, uh, you know, um, te uh, teleconsults uh, with video. And that's been a really major part of that. But nonetheless, it has not compensated for two things. The number has not quite met what it was before, the demand. But also, um, uh, people can't do a full diagnosis with tele. You actually need to do some hands-on stuff as well. Um, we are very aware of the tidal wave um, of people coming through with uh, non-communicable diseases, NCDs, um, cancers. Um, and we have the ambulance uh, chiefs here. And they state that not seeing people with heart attacks. And saying, where, what's happened to them? And of course, the answer is they're staying at home, staying at home longer, having damaged heart muscles and therefore not coming in. And when they do come in, they'll be much sicker and much more difficult to remediate than if they'd come in early like they're supposed to. So we're really worried about the tidal wave of NCDs, about acute care uh, needs that people aren't coming in. Um, and, you know, the worry is that this is going to this is going to be much more damaging than the COVID itself. And the message is, you know, keep your practice safe, uh, but allow people to come in. And for patients, practices are safe, please come in. We are here to look after you and serve your interests. Well, I guess that is one of the points for our next pandemic preparedness, which we have to focus on in order to really get normal health care done, even through a time of, of pandemic. Um, okay. And uh, certainly not only on a local, but also on a global scale, where this may even hit some poor countries worse than, than us in the rich parts of the world. Dr. Heikowal, thank you very much um, for this interview and taking the time. My pleasure. Thank you very much for asking me.